Hey, welcome to the New Year, end of the year edition of Commando on Demand Insider, your fast-paced weekly update straight from Kim's desk to your ears. I'm Mike James, and as we reflect back on 2019 and look forward to 2020, we decided to look back on some of our favorite interviews from the past year. And in just a bit, Kim talks with Heather Lloyd Martin. She's been featured in Forbes magazine, Entrepreneur magazine, and many others. She's talking about SEO, search engine optimization. So important if you have a small business or even personal sites, how do you get your website to the top of the Google search engine? We'll talk to Heather in just a few moments. Also, this week's hot topic, how do you extend your wireless router? It's happened to all of us. We're sitting in the living room or even just a little outside the front door, and all of a sudden you don't have any Internet access. We'll talk about that. Kim also checks in with a lady who turned her passion of baking into a business that makes over $200,000 a year. How did she do it? We'll find out. Plus, Kim has the three ways to hack-proof your life. We'll explore the eight ways you're ruining your Windows computer. Yeah, if your computer is slowing down, you might have a lot to do with it. Look at that. As well as our trivia. Every week, we give you a little brain buster to keep you thinking. And this week... Well, social media is everywhere. It's an enormous part of our lives, whether we like it or not. And you're probably familiar with hashtags. Of course you are. We use hashtags to help organize things and allow people to scroll through similar content. But you might not know what the technical term for hashtag is. No, it's not pound sign. Is it scrumple? Octothorpe? Plummet? Or Themidor? I'm not making this up. There is a technical term for hashtag. Is it Scrumple, Octothorpe, Plummet, or Themidor? <laughs> Write your answer down, and we're going to have the answer for you later on in this podcast. Quick reminder before we get started, this is not the Kim Commando Show. Every week, Kim gives you the very latest tech news, tips, DIYs, and we take your questions. For that podcast, just go to getkim.com. That's getkim.com. All right, we'll get started in a moment with a search engine optimization specialist here on Commando On Demand Insider. This is Commando On Demand, where we talk to some of the most influential people in technology, the innovators that shape the future and trailblazers who challenge and inspire us to do amazing things. Our first guest is an SEO expert. She's been featured in online marketing books as a pioneer of SEO copywriting. And you get to meet her right now on Commando On Demand. Here's Kim. All right. Our very next caller is for all of you folks who have your business online. And you've called me week after week because when you go to Google, the search results are not really the results that you want. Maybe you're like at the bottom of page one. Maybe you're on page two, which, let's face it, nobody goes to page two. So I challenged one of our fabulous producers, Manny Garcia, and I said, Manny, put on that investigative hat, Manny. Go find us the best SEO expert in the world. And that's who we have. So if you have a business, you're wondering how to get to the Google, the top search results, I'm going to introduce you to Heather in Portland, Oregon. Hi, Heather. Hey there. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. So if you had to name one secret in SEO, what what might it be? (laughs) Um, I love this question because so many people think that SEO is a bunch of technical tips and tricks and geeky back-end things. But the one thing that Google is looking for to be able to position that page in the top 10 results is really good standout content, content that answers the user's question and gives information that isn't shown on the other results. It's unique and it's your precise slant on what that answer could be. So when companies think about writing good content for their users, yeah, there's things you need to do to be able to help that content position, but that is usually the first step, not thinking about writing it for Google writing it for your actual audience, the people that are spending money with you or reading your content. So that this way, if they Google something that you might actually show up, right? Exactly, which is what we want. We want to show up and then people to click through on that result from the search results page and end up on your site. 
You know, let me ask you a question, though, because uh, as you start seeing like Google change over the years, Heather, and I know you're familiar with this, but I just want to explain for all of our listeners, is that it used to be a time that when you Googled, like, for example, apple pie recipe, right, that you'd see all these various websites that would give you different apple pie recipes. But now when you Google apple pie recipes, you see like the actual recipe on the Google search results page. And people don't have to click through to go to the site anymore, right? Exactly. And that's detrimental to traffic. Is there a secret to not doing that? Or how do you get people? I mean, is there some kind of magical phrase you can put up there to say, this is only part of the recipe to hit my website for the whole thing? Now, it's really interesting you mentioned that because in the search results world um, and the geeky SEO world, we love those kinds of results often because those are position zero. And sometimes what we find is that there are times that we get better click through through for those kinds of results because in a way, Google is saying, hey, this is the true authoritative source for apple pie recipes. So it might not be exactly what somebody wants from a traffic generation standpoint, but it does show that what you're doing is on the right track for Google. And chances are there are other pages on your site that are positioning, maybe not for that position zero, but positioning top 10 and driving traffic to your site. So how do you get the, how, how do I get, like, if I had a tip on, like, locking down your wireless router, how do I get to be position zero? <laughs> uh, that is a combination of a few factors. Uh, what I like to recommend to folks that are looking for that kind of result is to first look at who's positioning now and to start reverse engineering it. In a lot of cases, those types of results are list based where you have specific do this, do that, and do the other thing. And it's very clear. It's very conversational. And there's not a lot of fluff. And that answer is towards the top. So when you're writing your content, you can look at see what is positioning in that position zero and see how you can create similar type of content, again, unique and providing your own unique slant and information. But looking at that kind of structure, you can also look at getting links into that page where you are trying to get that position because those links from authoritative sources can help give Google the signal of like, yes, they, it's you know, not just the odor of the site. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that's, re that's really interesting because you actually bring up another point because so many years I've always heard, Heather, and I'm sure you have like, you know, your the direct result of you getting to the top of the Google search results is how many credible links come back into your into your site. It, does that right. still play a big part? Links are always going to be important for search. But what's interesting is in a conference that happened over the summer, they come up with what the what are the elements involved in what how a site positions. And experts are now saying that the content is more important than the links, which makes sense because you have to have really good content for people to want to link into it and basically recommend it to their users and their readers. Okay, so everything goes back to content. Now, I know I'm firing, yeah, everything I, goes back to okay, content. I, I know I'm firing a lot of questions at you because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to think of like the six million listeners that we have. Like, I want to ask you all their questions. Um, <laughs> And because, you know, so another another question that pops up on the show from time to time is people will say, you know, I have somebody who's pitching me that they're an SEO expert and they, they say that they can guarantee the top of the Google search results. And I was telling me nobody can guarantee that. Is there something that that if if they wanted to outsource this, is there a way to do this? Oh, you can definitely outsource the SEO. A lot of companies do, or they might do a little bit in-house, but outsource the stuff they're not good at. Like some companies don't have anyone available to write the content. Maybe they aren't good at writing themselves. They, aren't, they don't have the bandwidth. So it's entirely appropriate to outsource that. At the same time, if you're being pitched by an SEO company who's saying that they have proprietary ways of doing things and can guarantee you a top ranking in Google and they have a special relationship with Google, yeah, that's those are good. all really big red flags. Right. <laughs> that's okay. time to walk away. Okay, just one last question. If sure. there were, aside from content, what's, what's the next important thing? Ooh, 
Ooh, aside from content, that would be the links. Okay, so, so um, we're talking content and links. And so if you're trying to get to the top of the Google search results, it goes back to having something that somebody actually wants to read and it's compelling content. And I know if you're sitting there, you're selling archery, whatever it may be, it may be hard, but start thinking about putting a blog there, getting some credible links. We're talking about news links and, and some other credible sources in there. And we'll post a link to Heather's website and her blog, but she's got a lot of great tips on her website about SEO and SEO marketing. It's happened to everybody. Uh, the old computer just ain't what it used to be. It's kind of slowing down, but... How are you contributing to your Windows computer slowing down? Well, we've got eight things that you could potentially be doing to slow down your computer and how to fix them. That's next on Commando On Demand. All right, let's talk about boosting your Wi-Fi. It's a common problem. I mean, you get to certain parts of your house, no bars and more places. Now, nowadays, you've got a couple of options, replacing your router altogether with a more powerful model, or you can get a mesh router system The other is stretching the signal from your existing router using Wi-Fi extenders, and that option won't break the bank. Now, they're called Wi-Fi extenders, repeaters, boosters. They're a fraction of the cost of new routers, especially when we start looking at mesh setups. What they do is they improve coverage by taking signals from your router and then repeating them to certain parts of your home. In case you're looking for the best repeaters out there, look no further than commando.com. There's a whole list of them over there, and we have our picks for the wireless extenders. Want tech DIY videos from people you trust? Go on over to the Kim Commando YouTube channel and you'll see why Kim's America's top digital expert. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a video. Just go to youtube.com slash Kim Commando Show. Still to come on Commando On Demand, a successful vlogger. She's a baker, she's written a cookbook, and she's making money kind of living the dream and doing what she loves to do. Kim talks to Tessa Arias in just a few minutes. Right now, though, we all use computers in one capacity or another, but that doesn't mean that we're that great at taking care of those computers. There are things we can do time and time again that make it difficult to keep our machines in tip-top shape. Uh, And, of course, it's true that we can't prevent computers from malfunctioning, but we can do our part to ensure we're not actively ruining our computers. So here are eight ways that you could be ruining your Windows computer. Starting with number one, you don't use or update your antivirus software. Using the Internet, of course, can be risky if you're not properly protected. Using good antivirus or anti-malware software is very important in making sure that you're doing your part to keep your Windows PC safe. So if you're setting up a new computer and plan on taking it online, you need to make sure to install decent software with a valid subscription or a free subscription if you prefer. It's not enough to just install antivirus software, though. You need to make sure you update it regularly and also use it for regular scans. If you don't keep your virus software updated, you might as well be inviting viruses and malware into play. Don't give bad actors an easy way into your computer. Uh, Secondly, if you use weak or easy-to-guess passwords, you could be ruining your Windows computer. If you've set your cat's name as the password for your desktop or list your favorite food or for your password for your banking software, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Suppose you accidentally leave your Windows laptop somewhere. Those passwords are painfully easy to guess, especially anyone with even a little bit of knowledge about you. And if you want to eliminate the possibility of someone guessing your password and gain access to all your important files, you're going to want to start using much harder to guess passwords, plain and simple. Number three on our list is you never defrag your hard drive. Yes, defragging is still around and you still need to do it every once in a while. It's an important step if you want to make sure your computer remains efficient and running the way it should. Fragmentation ends up happening when your computer saves data in all kinds of different sectors. And when this happens, it can be difficult for your computer to perform in the same way later on as all the information is spread out everywhere. So it's important to perform frequent defrag tasks here and there. And if you want to learn more about that, just look up defrag my computer on commander.com. If you aren't paying attention to software updates, is number four on our list. Software becomes outdated. It's a fact of life. You can't assume that software that works fine now is going to remain doing so for the rest of the time that you use your computer. 
So with that in mind, you need to actually pay attention and accept the warnings that pop up on your computer and tell you there are critical updates that need to be completed. Instead of ignoring them, make sure you actually do the things they're asking you to do. Update regularly and you'll be protected against a litany of vulnerabilities that may otherwise crop up and could even put you in a world of hurt. All right, number five on our list is never clean up your computer or delete old files. Who hasn't done this? No matter what the purpose of your computer is, whether you use it for work or play, you've likely filled up your hard drive with different kinds of files. Many people just let those files pile up until there's just no space left at all, which is, of course, a really bad idea. You're using space that you could be allocating elsewhere keeping things cluttered and ensuring you're running a system that isn't as efficient as it could be. You should be cleaning up those files from time to time, free up memory for better system performance, as well as to keep things tidy in general. There's really no reason to have a bunch of those old files just piling up on your desktop or wherever you put them anyway. Number six on our list is the download file. Of course, we'll download just about anything. I'm certainly guilty of this. We go online, see advertisements for plenty of stuff. A lot of it might sound legitimate, but even if you don't know where a piece of software comes from, you probably shouldn't be downloading it. Bottom line, downloading anything will almost certainly end in frustration as you could be unwittingly inviting viruses, malware, or other dangerous software onto your computer. You never know what kind of nefarious purposes unknown downloads could hold. So be smart about whatever you're downloading and also use software gleaned from the proper channels. Number seven on our list, you let your PC get physically dirty. It's one thing to let files pile up on your hard drive, but letting the computer's components get physically dirty is another story in and of itself. Computer fans collect a lot of dust. You've probably seen the inside of a computer and you know this, but... Out of sight, out of mind. So keyboards collect grime and PCs aren't running well or optimized with either one of those issues going on. So you could potentially cause your computer to overheat or improperly function if you're not cleaning it regularly, which is a pretty easy problem to remedy. But you do have to stay on top of things if you want to prevent it. Most PCs, the side pops off, stick a vacuum cleaner in there and uh, clean off the motherboard. And the fan, like we talked about, you can stick the vacuum over the keyboard and suck out any of that stuff. One thing that helps things get loose is a good old paintbrush. Just take your paintbrush. Works like a charm. If you never clear your browser's cache or cookies, you found uh, number eight on our list. You've probably heard about this process before but never actually do it. Cleaning on browser's cache and cookies is a quick and simple maintenance tip that you can do in a blink of an eye, basically. Getting rid of needless files and clutter that comes from using the internet can speed things up considerably. Many people have a vague idea of what this entails, but don't actually go through with doing it. Make sure you're cleaning up your computer's files like this on a regular basis. Now that you have an inkling of ways that you could very well be damaging your computer, you can start down that path to make it better. And remember, make it a habit so you don't have to have all this stuff piling up. Okay, Tessa Arias is a successful blogger, a successful entrepreneur, and a successful culinary expert. We'll hear how she turned her love into a side business with Kim in just a few moments on Commando On Demand. It'd be pretty hard to break into some industries, especially the movie industry, or becoming a voice actor in a popular video game series. But if you've got the talent... Yes... You know, the Halo video game series has been around for nearly two decades. Well, those are some of the sounds you'll hear on the next installment that's coming out soon. And yes, that's a real voice actor making them. His name is Groiza. He's a pug, a very happy pug, who just happens to be best friends with the video game studio's technical art director. And this small dog is providing talents for some of the extraterrestrial sounds in the upcoming game, like grunts and heavy breathing. Halo Infinite is set to be released sometime next year. But will it be enough to launch this pup's career in Hollywood? Time will tell. It's a dog-eat-dog world out there. Worried about your privacy and your Amazon Echo? In Kim's new ebook, How to Use Your Amazon Echo Tips and Tricks, you'll learn how the pros use Alexa and still maintain privacy. Get advice you can trust. Search Kim Commando on your Kindle to get your copy now. 
It's Commando on Demand. Hope you have your answer for our trivia question, which is, what is the technical term for hashtag? And it's not pound sign. Is it is it scromple, octothorpe, plummet, or themidor? We're going to have an answer in a few minutes. Right now, it's Kim and another successful entrepreneur. So many people dream of turning their hobby into a career. Well, my next guest did just that. When she started college, she wanted a creative outlet where she could share her passion for baking with others. And it's that kind of burning passion that has made Tessa Arias so successful. She started with a blog, and now she has her own cookbook, over a thousand recipes published online, and a half a million visitors to her site, HandleTheHeat.com, each month. Hey, thanks for being with us, Tessa. And I want to start by asking, how exactly did you turn a food blog into a six-figure income? (laughs) Well, I thanks for having me, Kim. Um, I would have never thought that that was the path that this would lead to when I started 10 years ago when I just had the whim to start a blog and went for it and had no idea I was going to make any income from it ever. And it kind of just grew organically from, like you said, my passion for it. And so right now, um, with all the people that visit the site every day, every month, especially around the holidays... Uh, The ads on my site, the sponsors that I work with, the cookbooks and other products that I sell help to generate that income. Well, that's so sweet. No pun intended. Now, how are your recipes different? Because there are so many food blogs on the Internet, right? So many different food websites. How are your recipes different? So I like to focus on homemade baking from scratch with an emphasis on the science of baking, because if anyone's ever stepped in the kitchen and cooked versus baked something, you know, there's definitely a difference with baking. It's very precise. You have to have a basic understanding of the ingredients and how they work. And that's the information I like to empower my readers with so that they know why it's important to have room temperature eggs when you're making a cake or why you're using baking soda instead of baking powder, stuff like that. And so do advertisers approach you or there are various agencies that you work with? How does the money come in? Yeah, so that could go either way. Sometimes if there's a brand I really love um, and am passionate about and use in my personal life, I will reach out to them. Uh, Sometimes they reach out to me with opportunities they think might be a good fit. Sometimes it's someone that's directly working with the brand, or sometimes it's a PR agency that has the brand as a client. And so it comes in a variety of ways. And I found that my best work is often done when I'm working with someone who is really close with the brand. Um, One of my sponsors for this month, actually, I have a monthly baking challenge that I host and Bob's Red Mill is a current sponsor and they are um, an employee owned company. So it's really fun to get to work with sponsors like that because they have a bigger mission behind the work. And so do you find more success on Facebook or are you primarily focused on Instagram? Instagram for sure is where it's at right now with stories and videos. It's just so fun to interact with uh, my audience there and I can answer messages and questions and see what people are engaging with, what kind of content they're really enjoying. And I really love um, the visuals of Instagram. I'm a visual person myself. And those mouthwatering food images are just, it's just such a fun platform. Have you noticed, because a lot of people have said this, Tessa, that since Facebook took over Instagram, like the algorithms are changing. Do you see that with your business? Oh, yes. And it changes so often. And usually it's kind of like, you're scrambling to figure out what happened because we rarely know, um, we rarely anticipate the change. It kind of just comes overnight and you hope that it didn't affect you negatively. Um, Even Google just changed an algorithm last week and luckily it affected me positively. But that's why in general with my business, I try not to rely too much on one platform, whether it's social media or Pinterest or Google. So that way, you know, if something does change, it's out of my control, I can weather that storm. And, you know, Tessa, you bring up a really interesting point, because right now, if I Google, say, apple pie recipe, it appears in the Google search results. No longer am I going to, say, Food Network or maybe even your website. Has that really impacted you? Oh, yes. In the past, um, a couple of years ago, I had an issue with my website, a tech issue that I wasn't aware of. It was way beyond my understanding. And unfortunately, it caused a problem with Google, and I lost about 20% of my traffic within a couple of weeks and it took nine months to regain it. Now, luckily, because there are other ways that I can monetize 
the website and my content, it wasn't devastating, but it was certainly a stressful period. And so what do you think's next? Pizza? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, funny you say that. Uh, I'm heading to LA next month and I'm on a mission to find the best pizza that the West Coast has to offer. So let's see what I find. Well, that'd be pretty awesome. Uh, I love making homemade pizza, by the way. It's amazing and it's fun. Maybe I'll be stopping by your house then. <laughs> you got it. Hey, thanks, Tessa, for joining us. And your story really is just amazing. There's no doubt that you can definitely handle the heat. And you know what else is hot? Yes, my Commando community. It's an advertising-free community where you can make friends, stay informed, and get exclusive access to my show. There's even a forum where you can find and post your recipes. It costs less than a cup of coffee a month, and I'm never going to track or sell your data. Sign up right now over at community.commando.com, and I'll see you there. Every week we find a fun trivia question for you that's related to technology, and this week the trivia question is about hashtags. Of course, hashtags help us organize things and allow people to scroll through similar content, but you might not know what the technical term for hashtag is. Did you guess? Is it Scrumple, Octothorpe, Plummet, or Themidor? Well, if you guessed B, the Octothorpe, you would be 100% right. Long before it became a social media staple beginning about 2007, and well before it started making its way onto phone dials back in the 60s, it had another use hundreds of years prior. According to one origin story, the symbol began in the 14th century and was used to abbreviate the weights of gods. And based on some of the things it's used for today, it probably would be kind of nice to have it still used that way. Thanks for listening to Commando On Demand. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you get this every week automatically, right, downloaded to your device. And here's Kim with some final thoughts. In the beginning of Internet time, online customer reviews were a great idea. People would buy a product and post an honest review telling you all about the good, the bad, and the ugly. But today, too many of these reviews are phony because of unscrupulous vendors. Sometimes big companies hire click farms to write their reviews. Amazon is fighting back, but as fast as they take them down, others just pop up. And with the holiday buying season just ahead, here are three ways to spot phony reviews. If all the reviews posted are glowing five stars, stop. If most of the reviews are bad with nothing positive, stop again. And too many internet influencers accept merchants' products for free without telling you, making the entire review process suspicious. And finally, some reviews posted are just a joke, really like this one for an Amazon Kindle waterproof case. The reviewer says, got this for my mother-in-law for bath time, hoping it'd be crap and electrocute her. Great for waterproof kindling, crap for murder. If you ever need some digital advice, because I know you can Google everything, but you never know what you're going to get with that Google, right? Uh, is that you can always make an appointment to speak with me. Head over to the website. That's Commando with a K, of course. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a link that says Be a Caller. And fill that form out, and then you got me. Hey, thanks for listening to Commando on Demand Insider. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Happy New Year.